Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this dreary Thursday morning on another episode of Historia Canadiana. I am rusty from this. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't recorded in like three weeks and it shows. Anyway, my name is Patrick and with me as always is my lovely co-host Mackenzie. Hello. How are you? I am good. I am chilling. I am trying to wake myself up and psych myself up, which well, is easy to do with a show like this because it's just so good. Thank you for hyping up our own show. <laughs> Speaking of, speaking of hyping people up, as always, before we get started, we'd like to thank our regular patrons, Craig, Jessica, Elise, Tommy, and James. Uh, you're all very appreciated. And of course, every once in a while, we get donators, which we also appreciate greatly. So if you want to help support this show... Uh, and get for, a shout out. And get a shout out, get extra episodes, get all that good stuff. You can sign up for $3 a month over at patreon.com. You can also sign up for $1 a month. Um, you also get a shout out, but you don't get the extra episode, but it still helps us in mm -hmm. our, your own way. Um, all right, getting right into it because we're recording this right before I have to go to work. So we're going to be relatively efficient in this one. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to be talking about um, a little known massacre in Canada's history, I think in the grand scheme of things, but one that has had an impact in terms of the structure of Canadian politics and has had an conflict impact. Conflict resolution. Exactly, conflict policing. resolution. Absolutely. And uh, overall, just the perception of Western Canada, for example, I think it's had an impact uh, as well. Back in Western Canada. <laughs> And actually today, uh, as a kind of cultural item that we're going to use, we're going to be using our first author from Saskatchewan, who's a contemporary author called Guy Vanderhaeg. It was like the first one that we've ever used formally from that province, and that's kind of cool. We can shade in another part of the map, Saskatchewan. I think all we have left at this point is Alberta. I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure. And like the territories. Do we have to? No. Okay. No, we can kind of ignore Alberta for a while. <laughs> Um, no, but all jokes aside, um, Mac, do you feel like starting with the cultural part or the historical part today? Um, uh, let's go, we can start with the cultural part, because this, this, this movie is, well, this book slash call a TV movie miniseries yep. mm -hmm. is really kind of fascinating. Right. It really is good. So for context, we're talking about Guy Vander Higgs, um, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, but his book, and later the adapted miniseries, The Englishman's Boy. So Mac watched the miniseries, I read the book, and saw the miniseries. It's, the miniseries is free on YouTube, by the way. Yes. Anybody can watch this. Yeah. Um, that's what's great with a lot of Canadian content, is they kind of just put it on for free, either on CBC or on yeah. YouTube. Because it's eventually. all part of, like, public broadcast education. Yeah. You know? That being said... Like the it, whichever listeners want to watch, it's written by the same guy. The TV miniseries was also written by Guy Vanderhaeg, and it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, there's right? no big changes in that page no. from what Patrick has told me. No, no, no. So that's why, like, it really didn't matter which one we talked about today. The general ideas, themes, and plot is virtually unchanged. Um, but yeah, like. Just a bit on Guy Vanderhaeg. You hadn't heard of him, right, before we no. started talking oh, about no. this? Like most Canadian authors, I have not heard of him. <laughs> it was like, especially contemporary ones, like outside of Margaret Atwood or like uh, Jan Martel, right, Alice Munro. Like they'll, they'll be the big ones. But Guy Vanderhaeg is actually pretty well known. Um, or at least he's well recognized critically, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like I was saying, he grew up in a mining town in southern Saskatchewan. Uh, a Canadians town called to do. <laughs> Esterhazy, which sounds like a village that has like 200 people in it. Yeah. Um, he's actually a history major from the University of Saskatchewan, which considering the subject matter of this episode, I'm not surprised. And of this particular uh, text that we're reading, uh, he actually completed his master's degree and then he did a degree in education um, mm. at the University of Regina. Education! There you go. That. No, but it does, I think, like, knowing that does kind of inform his writing and his 
his interests, I think. And we'll get into this. Esther with this Hazy history. has a population of 2,400 people. Wow. That's much more than I expected. Yeah. Okay. Good for Esther Hazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but before actually working full time, Guy Vanderhaeg worked as an archivist, researcher, and even a high school teacher throughout the 70s. He was writing throughout then, but mostly short stories that um, were well received, but they didn't like, blow anything out of the water. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, And then in the 70s and 80s, that's when he started getting more recognition, right? Um, Where short stories like what I learned from Caesar were included in uh, compilations of best Canadian stories. And his first like major collection of stories, Man Descending in 1982, actually Mm -hmm. won the Governor General's Award. So like early on in his career, he was clearly like canonized, right? Because like the Governor General's Award for those who don't know is like the peak prize in Canada. Um, and pretty much from there, he was able to mostly live off of his living and actually do it, um, having established himself as like a really important new voice in Canada in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not long after that he turned to, um, to novel writing. And eventually, in 1996, he would come out with the book that we're talking about today, The Englishman's Boy, which was even more well-received than his previous things. It won uh, not only the Governor General's Award, but also the Saskatchewan Book Award. It was shortlisted for the Giller Prize. Um, It got all kinds of recognition. And as we talked about, it was adapted even to a TV miniseries. So that's we love our TV miniseries here in Canada. (laughs) Like that's really the peak. We don't have the funds to make big movies. We just make TV miniseries. But you say that. But did you actually look up the budget of the the, this thing? It was eleven. It was almost twelve million dollars to make this. Not bad. For a TV miniseries, that's really yeah. good. So it was two episodes, right? Most of that went to the casting of Bob Hoskins. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a name like that. I'm sorry, for folks who don't know, like Bob Hoskins, a very pro- <laughs> an old, a prominent actor, from, yeah. like a very good actor too. Mm-hmm. Probably his, one of his most famous roles would be like uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah, the Mario in Mario. Yeah, in Mario. <laughs> Anyway, he's in this movie, and he does a great job of yeah. his role as the, like, slimy movie movie studio producer. That's true. He really, he nails it. I don't know if most of, where most of the budget went, but, like, thinking about it now, the movie does look well made. Like, mm-hmm. the sets look well done. It don't look cheap. The stunts look good. Um, the acting is, is really interesting. So, uh, as you were saying, with Bob Hoskins and uh, Nicholas Campbell is the lead actor in this. Um, he's really good. Yep. Like twelve million dollars in nineteen ninety six goes a long way. <laughs> like, I think. Yep. Uh, uh, wasn't it the entire? Wasn't it Game of Thrones in its first seasons that had like similar budgets? So it's like, not. Yeah, it was something like that. In its later seasons too, it was almost like a million bucks per episode or something. Right. Or so like million. for a, for a made for TV movie like made by the CBC, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and it, the TV series actually won six Gemini Awards, which is kind of like the Canadian equivalent of the Emmys, um, or whichever Similar, one. Similar, sort of. Which is the, which the Emmys are for TV, right? Yes. Okay, so it's the, it's the Canadian Emmys. <laughs> that's what I, yeah. Um, all right. So that's a little bit on Guy Vanderhaeg, but what about the Englishman's Boy itself? Mac, how would you describe the story? Um, oh boy. It's it's good. Okay. It's an interesting a... no, but I'm trying to yeah because it's, it's like two stories mm-hmm. happening at the same time. The Englishman's boy is the story of the Cypress Hills massacre. I was told through the eyes of one of the participants mm-hmm. who is the Englishman's boy. Yeah. And then on the other side of that, the because from what I, I never I didn't finish, folks. I got like halfway through it and I had other stuff going on. <clears throat> and you also you get the story. Yeah. You watch half of it and you get what it's going for. Yes. So the Englishman's boy that is there is this son of a slave, or not a son of no no he but he's like a, he's not even a slave, but he's a worker for yes. an Englishman. Yes. He's a boy who works for an Englishman. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <clears throat> yes. He kills his erstwhile owner, master, whatever. Yeah, it's a bit nebulous in the book, at least, like whether he kills him or not, but yeah. Yeah, and then he leaves, and then he joins up with this party that's trying to look for their horses that they believe were stolen by First Nations people. (laughs) 
And so to do that, they believe that they ran off to Canada. Yep. So then they crossed the border into Canada, and that's where the Cypress Hill Massacre occurs. And then this boy survives, grows up, stays old, and then it goes to the 19... This is where the second part of the story comes up. The 1920s, there's a film producer, a scriptwriter called Harry. And Harry's looking for a big story about the West, because this is the time of Western stories right now. So they he finds this... He finds the Englishman, hears about him, tracks him down, and says, I want to write your story. Mm-hmm. And this is where the Bob Hoskins character comes in, because he's like, this is yeah. a story of America. This is a story of the American West and the American time. This of is going to be the biggest story. Good old this. American fortitude and progress. Mm-hmm. Right. This event that happened in Canada, this is an American story. Right. <laughs> as it goes, as things between America and Canada tend to go. <laughs> But it took place in Canada, but they were Americans who went up, in part. Americans and Canadians. Yep. Yes. So Harry writes down the story and gets the movie made. Yeah. So it's a bit, like, obviously these the, they're details that we'll kind of go over, but by and large, like, that's pretty much the 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 gist of it. God damn and, right it is. Yeah. Hell yeah. And obviously you get this really interesting dichotomy that's happening between... Um, between what um, Harry wants to write as a movie because he interviews short, uh, well, the, the twist, I guess, in the book is that the guy he interviews, Shorty McAdoo, right, is McAdoo. The, McAdoo is the Englishman's boy. Like, that's the big twist, even though, like, astute readers would probably be able to guess it. <laughs> I saw that coming from when I, I, I saw half of it and I knew that was what was going to happen. Right. Like, I don't, it's a, twist but not really like it's there for the purposes of story but there are more interesting things that go on in this book (laughs) um but like basically harry is hoping to get the truth right and that's that's the point of his script is like okay how did this really happen and of course damon ira chance the bob hoskins character is like no the point is not truth the point is movie going story is story right you want to sell an experience right and personally, like if if listeners don't want to see the entire movie, because I think in total it's like three hours. Um, but I think one of the introduction scenes really kind of sums this up in a really mm-hmm. good way. Um, not the part that starts off in the 19th century in 1873, but the first scene in the 1920s. Yeah. Right. So for for listeners who haven't seen it, the the first scene that you get in the 1920s is on a film set. Right, so you see this western that's being made, and remember, the 1920s is like the start of golden age in Hollywood. Like we're just starting to get talkies, um, we're starting to make like these really big movies, um, and you see this western being made by this seemingly assholeish director, and um, you see these cowboys that are forcing their horse to do this stunt. Mm-hmm. Right, and they're clearly unhappy. You you kind of guess through the through the story without it being explicitly said that these are legit cowboys that were hired as stunt people and because they knew horses, right? But they're clearly not being listened to by the director, right? Who just wants a really good shot of a horse running and falling. Right? And so they, this, uh, this cowboy does the stunt, the horse gets injured, and so does he, right? So does the stunt guy. The stunt guy hits his head and starts yeah. bleeding. The horse breaks its leg, right? And everybody's up in arms except the director who's like great i got my excellent shot meanwhile what you see are the cowboys who are like okay we need to take care of this guy who's bleeding out of his head and the horse is suffering and so the main cowboy just goes up to the horse and shoots it in the head right like this is the 1920s the wild west is done but you still have these people left who were cowboys really right but that's the thing is like to me, that it's a five-minute scene, not even, but it kind of perfectly encapsulates what they're going for, I think, with the entire thing, like spectacle versus reality, mm-hmm. right? The reality is that the West was a harsh and unforgiving place, right, in many ways, both for indigenous peoples who had to, like, face the settlers and for settlers who were trying to establish themselves there, right? Like, you just kind of had to have this cold-blooded vision of, like, well, this horse is not going to survive. You're going to, sh- <laughs> like, might as well shoot it. The horse ain't going to make it. The horse ain't going to make it. We're going to put it out of its misery. Versus like the rising interests of like Hollywood style glitz and glamour, right? The jazz age, right? Just, uh, just, Mm -hmm. and who just wants like 
to make it. We're gonna make a movie, see? We're gonna make a great movie. It's gonna be just like the real times of the Wild West, see? It's like, but sir, that's not how the Wild West went. I don't care Shut what you up. say, boy. <laughs> Go get me a coffee, woman. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and that's, by the way, one of the things I appreciate with this story is like, yes, they acknowledge that there's some whack stuff going on in the 20s and obviously in the 19th century. But I think Vander Haag does a really good job of not, uh, uh, how, how can I say this? Like he, he doesn't lean into it so hard that it's awkward and being like, oh, okay, like the women are a subpar class and okay, there's no black people and all that. Like he handles it adeptly, I think. Because um, it, it has focus. Like it is about this scene. It is about this time period and this focus on the old West. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Um, so anyway, like in terms of the actual history though, and we'll get into like discussion questions after. Like, the actual history of the Cypress Hills massacre is also very interesting um, because, as Max said, right, this is what opens the book and the movie, right? And it's one of the narratives, right? And so the actual thing pretty much happens as Mac described it, right? Um, where in 1873, um, this these people, these traders, and wolf these wolf hunters and whiskey. Uh, these illegal whiskey salesmen, I should point out, uh, these uh, whiskey traders, were looking for a stolen horse, right? Um, there is no substantial proof that it was an indigenous person who stole it or indigenous group who stole it. Mm -hmm. But considering the mentalities of the time, it was easier to blame just indigenous people and go hunt them because there was no laws. Fucking or... indigenous people. Yeah, and because... Like in the West, there were no, there was no law and order, right? That was kind of the like whole point of the Wild West was that there was nothing that could stop them from just going to kill a native person or take their stuff kill back. Them all. Right. Um, it's interesting because Cypress Hills itself is not like a major hub of anything, right? It was a place in between, right? Uh, and it was kind of this place where fur trade still happened, but also where new settlement was coming in from the east, right? And it was kind of this middle ground where traders had not le yet left, but farmers and mounties weren't quite there yet either. So it was like this weird transitional period, uh, and people didn't quite know what to do with it. Um, and around it, like Cypress Hills, you pretty much had the U.S. border that was really close, and it's right on the Alberta-Saskatchewan boundary, right? Like, situating it in geography, that's pretty much where it is. Um, and it's kind of this no-man's land between Plains, Cree, and Blackfoot uh, populations. Mm -hmm. um, and there was rich game there, but ultimately it was this dangerous place for travelers who didn't know what they were doing because there was literally nothing around there, right? Except, you know, populations that were at war with each other sometimes or who were antagonistic to settlers who were trying to take their land. Right? So like it wasn't exactly the best place to be. Um, so yeah, basically one, one of the things that helps incite, I guess, the Cypress Hills massacre um, or at least sets the stage for it, is that there were two forts that were constructed near there um, on Battle Creek, right? which is the forts Farewell, uh, Farwell, sorry, and Solomon, named after the people Battle who established it. Yeah, like great naming, by the way. Battle Creek is awesome. <laughs> um, and they were constructed as whiskey outposts. This was illegal, by the way. Like you couldn't just sell and buy whiskey in uh, willy-nilly but uh, again there was n literally no law or order or authority that could enforce the law right and the traders by that point were beyond the reach of american law because they were over the uh, they were in the canadian border um so pretty much um yeah like there there were some tensions in the area that had happened uh, that were rising before um the actual massacre like the forts and the local indigenous camps were kind of tense. Uh, there, there were tense feelings between the, each other, um, mostly because trading stocks were low and most of the Americans that were set up there preferred to hire out Métis people to freight their furs and hides to Montana rather than hire the indigenous populations. Uh, and 
it's in this kind of like tense situation where these wolf hunters, these wolfers and traders that you mentioned arrive in this, uh, arrive Talking in this. Wolfers. Right. But it's like, basically it was fuel to a fire. That was, uh, it was a match to a fuel that was already mm-hmm. about to blow. Right. Um, as we saw many, many times throughout North American Western history, right? Conflicts between settlers and indigenous populations happened all the time. Right? This one was just an inciting incident waiting to happen, right? Pretty much. Uh, as it is, as it goes. There you go. And that's, that's where pretty much what you were talking about uh, before, this is where this happens. So these wolfers are looking for horses that they think were stolen by Cree people. Um, and the settlers who are already at the established whiskey forts are like, yeah, maybe try the Assiniboine over there, right? They might have something that you want. And so it basically led to a confrontation between the, um, the settlers, the, the, the traders, the, and hunters with the Assiniboine. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, it led to straight up gunfire. And the complete, the complete destruction of the Assiniboine camp, right? Complete destruction of the Assiniboine camp! Oh, I, I don't know if we, should, if we should make a song out of that one. <laughs> um, but, you know, because the, this, this stolen horse, right, um, which Just, actually, by the way, had been found before the violence started. Like, they found yeah. it again, right? Um, but that didn't matter at that point. Like, the settlers were kind of on a war path, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, like, it's... Anyway. Settlers and war path, it's always there. Because that's the mentality That's the mentality you put yourself in to try and survive all the way out there. Right. Like, you have to have that instinct of something is out to get me and that kind of paranoia to survive. Right. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're not going to make it out there. Yeah. Like, that's just the law of the land when it comes to settling the West. Mm-hmm. Which is why there were so many dangerous and, like, dumb things that happened. Right. That's the thing. And that's one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about the Englishman's boy, right? Mm-hmm. And this is one of the things that is developed throughout or until you find out what the massacre is, is that the Englishman's boy, and I think this is true with the series as well, like, he starts, he starts off as a pretty normal guy, right? Like, he, yes, he's aware of his... That w- of what he's in, of what kind of situation he's in, but he's not like a straight up murderer necessarily. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he was, he's not someone who starts off the book as a person who would just willy nilly go up to an indigenous camp and kill them. Right, right. But as they're going more and more up north, it's kind of interesting to see how you get or how this particular character gets wrapped up in exactly what you're talking about. Right. Like as the other traders are talking to him and saying like, oh, you know, these uh, damned Indians and whatever that stole our horse. And as they're getting into more and more drunk diatribes, like the mentality of the West slowly starts to infuse into the Englishman's boy to the point where it's almost inevitable that he participates in this. Right. He's got to participate. But that's the thing. So it's like, it's a men- I think you're absolutely right in pointing to this idea that it's a mentality at some point. It goes beyond just whether someone wants to or not. It's just, it's the driving force behind Western settlement at that point. Right. right. Um, coming back to the actual history of it, though. So as you we were saying, the horse was actually found before <laughs> any, uh, oh, yeah. any violence ensued. But by then, the like we were saying they were kind of on the war path and also the s- traders and settlers were fueled by alcohol um alcohol wonderful stuff which again kind of fits in by the, the way devil's with, drink <laughs> yeah that's the thing is like once we start hearing about the aftermath of this the the, the, the fact that they were drunk and that they were whiskey traders would definitely come into play in like the rhetoric around is like, oh, these terrible people and see what whiskey's kind of done. And it kind of fed into the moral panics of the time about alcohol. Right. Um, uh, so, and also, yeah, so exactly. They were fueled by alcohol and it, it was as- And a is, moral panic. Right. And as it was typically typical of the time, it was terribly one-sided, right? The white right. people had repeating rifles. The, the natives had bows and old muskets. Like they hadn't, like we were saying, they hadn't traded properly with the local whiskey traders for some time because they mostly kept to the Métis. Right. And so like they were just 
completely outmatched, right, in this case. And it's in this context that the massacre happens in which 40 homes were burned, bodies were mutilated, women were held prisoner and raped, right? And it's estimated that about 20 Assiniboine were died Mm or were killed, and only one American died. (laughs) So obviously worth it for a horse. Jesus. But here's the thing, right? There was genuine... There was a genuine attempt to kind of bring the people to justice, Mm. right? Uh, Both on the American side, um, which was a bit more difficult because they acknowledged, the Americans acknowledged that there was wrongdoing, which is a bit hard not to. Um, But because the deed took place outside of their jurisdiction, it was much harder to actually enforce the law on them. Uh, Okay. Right. And that's how they get out of it. That's kind of how do they, they get out of it. Also, People in Montana, like popular support was for the settlers. <laughs> this is something that I read and I was like, this is madness. Like, how can you, again, I guess it kind of fits in with the general mentality of the time. Like the general public was just like, yeah, the, 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 the white people were totally justified in this. Right? Their, <laughs> like, their, their horse was stolen. What were they supposed to do? Right. And this kind of fits in with what you were talking about before we were recording. It's like the, the importance of property kind of takes precedent over Anything yeah. Else, right. Yeah. So what we were talking about in relation to that is this use. This is the creation of the Mounted Police, right? So right afterwards. Yeah. After this, we get the early like it's not the actual Mounted Police, but it's the early start of that. Yeah. It's literally it's called the Northwest Mounted Police rather than the RCMP as we know it, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Mm-hmm. But yes, it is. Um, like it had already been in. T- there had already been talks to create such a police force for the West, especially with the creation of the railroad that was planning, it was being planned. But mm-hmm. this was the, the, the massacre was the incident that forced the Canadian government's hand. It was like, okay, let's fast track this. Yeah. And the point of a police force, and this is a common misconception with police, mm-hmm. they are not there to protect people. Right. They are like, so they... The point of a police force is actually their job is to protect property. That Do you feel like the... this is still true today? Oh, As... 100% yes. Okay. When the police gets called, it's for things like a murder is handled by a detective more than anything else. Right. You know, like a lot of these things that we think the police were like, this is what they're supposed to deal with. It's actually not, which is why certain cases are so hard for them to deal with. Mm-hmm. Something like even battery and assault is it's not, like we call for it and it gets tracked down and even the best you can use and all these other like crimes of a person on person. Mm-hmm. They they aren't as equipped in the handling of that. Right. They're not equipped to handle like they know how to negotiate, they know how to handle tense situations, but they're more trained to save the thing, save the right. property. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And this kind of, and as you're saying, this kind of goes all the way back to its origins, right? Obviously, and here's a, like a little bit of history, like people, have, the police forces, in a sense, have existed for quite some time, right? But the modern iteration of it has, was kind of emerged in the, 18th, in the 19th century, right? As we know it today, because mostly before police forces were there to protect uh, local municipalities, especially in and around a sovereign right? Uh, again, kind of going back to who the police <laughs> were meant to protect are the powerful and property owners, but hey, that's whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, in, in the 19th century, this was kind of formalized. And what you saw uh, as it was emerging, for example, in places like the United States and Britain and France and et cetera, is that they were mostly sent out to uh, poorer neighborhoods, which happened to be immigrant populations often. And they were often, as you were saying, there to make sure that people didn't steal or to make sure that there was no vagrancy. Like that was the point of a police force. So yeah, even poverty, yeah. the upholding of vagrancy isn't about protecting people. It's about no. some kind of moral belief and moral ideology. Exactly. And so that's who like, is allowed to be on a public space. Yeah. Right. And that's the same thing of like, again, even domestic abuse cases, assault and battery, blah, blah. It's about mm-hmm. upholding some kind of moral idea and belief over actually keeping these people keeping people safe right exactly so it's like 
you saw a similar history here in Canada, where it's like most before the before eighteen seventy three, when the Northwest Mounted Police was kind of formally created, there were police forces, but they were mostly municipal, and you had a government constabulary, which was called the Dominion Police, but they were only there to guard federal buildings, right, and enforcing certain federal statutes. They were far from being like a countrywide thing, as. Uh, as we see today. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but once the massacre happens, they kind of form the Northwest Mounted Police. The RCMP, as we know it today, would only be formed in 1921. Right? But the mentality kind of, I think, still uh, perpetuates itself, as we're saying today. Like, while the police do do other things, um, sometimes things that they're not equipped to handle, right? as, you're, uh, as you were pointing to, nevertheless, like, their main goal is to kind of continuously police you know minority populations or yeah. property because of that belief that oh we see these people oh, they're the ones that do it most of the time it's yeah because you look for them yeah no no wonder you're and there also, all it's the like, time you kind of have to take into consideration like why why yeah. like what kind of social context put this into place right and i think this is particularly interesting and we can kind of segue i think into the general discussion a bit um of both the story and the general history is like the it's interesting that you know we have this mentality today of oh you know a lot of indigenous people um are you know perpetrate crimes for example and things like that it's like yeah but why <laughs> like, yeah like why are they doing this think about it like within the span of a few years you had a police force that was put into place to specifically police their localities right uh to to defend them because that was the initial point i guess was to protect these indigenous populations from white encroachment that was the whole point of the police force it's debatable as to whether or not that worked because you know as you were saying like in a few years you had this which so suddenly your population is actively watched over by an armed force and you had the indian act not too long after like no kidding that certain populations would end up with a higher criminality rate <laughs> right like you're not giving them the best of chances right? um and i think it's kind of interesting that while the canadian government went into this i think with some good intentions Oh, it's always here's the here's the rub. Here's the rub when it comes to all these issues. Mm -hmm. I'd say maybe half the time or something like that. It's no kind of legitimate racism. Right. These people were just so dumb, misinformed, and arrogant more than anything else. They right. are they they want to protect First Nations people because of their belief that it is their duty to do so. Right. Like none of this comes from any bad intentions. Mm -hmm. These all come from this belief that we are better than them, that we are not the same species. Exactly. There's a game, there's a game called Red Dead Redemption. And in the game, you <laughs> say, no no no, because this it's cowboys and shit, and there's a really yeah, yeah, good yeah. moment no, no, that the it. game has. Sure. And one of the, you're, you're helping this like scientist, anthropologist, researcher guy. Yeah. And at one point he examines the blood cells of a First Nations person, the blood cells of a white man. And he goes, oh my God, they're the same. <laughs> it's like this moment of realization. <laughs> okay. Like, no, like that, and that's the mentality that a lot of these governments and radios had. Like, they legitimately, I think a lot of times they legitimately did want to help or did want to do good. Mm -hmm. They're just so misinformed, arrogant, and not willing to listen to reason. Yeah. But that's the thing is like, because you see this explicitly in the in the rhetoric and the way they talk about the idea of needing to police the West, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like, it's specifically there to protect. Um, to protect indigenous populations, not only from attacks by, in this case, wolf, or, wolf traders and whiskey traders, but also the oncoming railroad. Yeah. Right. Like, and again, this is like a perfect image of what's happening in this moment is the needs of industrial progress and, um, you know, 19th century capitalism, just kind of barreling through the West. Right. And who needs to be protected from this? Or rather, I think protected should be changed to who needs to be excluded or pushed away from this, right, mm -hmm. is the indigenous populations. And that's kind of what the police serve to do. And it's extra interesting because what you often see are indigenous populations trying to stop the building of the railroad, right? In many ways, because it went on their land. And so 
who were they who were the northwest mounted police really protecting in this case right were they protecting the indigenous people who were clearly trying to stop the railroad or were they protecting some other interests like i'm not meaning this in like a conspiracy theory type of way i just think like people don't at the time i think you're right in saying that they went with good intentions but they didn't look at the bigger picture or f- chose not to think of it in its wider implications right um but uh, yeah what i was going to say like Basically, it's kind of interesting because by creating the Northwest Mounted Police and justifying the creation of it in that sense, the Canadian government also inadvertently justified its own existence, right? Uh, The the, the existence of that police force, right? By perpetuating the nightmarish vision of what the West would become. (laughs) But it's like, when you think of it, that's kind of what happened because there wasn't a police force for a long time. And like Indigenous people were fine for a while. And then... Like by their very present, by the very presence of the settler population, they justify their own need for a police force, <laughs> which should ring a few bells. But hey, that's that's just me. Yeah. <sighs> I, Go ahead. I don't know. It's yeah. I think this is linking back to the Englishman's boy. I think that's what makes the second story so brilliant about the 1920s movie that's being made around this, mm-hmm. because that's how. Like, even now, that's how we perceive things, almost. Like, there's this glam and glitz dramatification that we like to do. Yep. Well, you see this, I think, like, explicitly. And what you saw, like, Vanderhaeg doesn't explicitly approach it, but I think it's interesting. It's like, you saw this a lot in Hollywood, right? Uh, In the 1920s, um, both in Canada, well, both with Canadian subjects, I should say, because Canada's film industry was not huge in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Um, But like in Canadian subjects and American subjects is the desire to look at history. And the medium of film is geared, I think, towards the glitz and glamour, right? Here's the thing of like, uh, because I had actually a prof who brought a really interesting point at one point Mm. and saying these these historical versions of history that we see and that we watch in movies. Yeah. Are they really that much worse than textbooks that have gone through like 10 different editions? Right. Are they really that much worse than these other like, like we take poems as historical like documents. Those That's are, true. poems are the original over dramatization. Okay, right. like let's. <laughs> the dramatization. The, 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 it's early, folks. <laughs> it's early in the morning for me. I'm waking up with a slight hangover. <laughs> It's the best time to talk about the police and massacres is with a hangover. <laughs> no, but you're you're right in the sense that obviously I don't think either of us are claiming that you know a complete dramatization is the same thing as um, a historical book or anything like mm-hmm. that. Like there is at some point a certain level of facts that you can give or not, and. I think that's something that explicitly this novel explores, right? Because Damon Chance, the producer, is completely uninterested in facts, Mm -hmm. right? At the very least, like some poetry that we've talked about, for example, on this show or some textbooks claim to be founded in reality, in a sense, and like have things to back themselves up. Whereas Chance and a lot of movie productions at this time are just completely unfounded, even though they pass themselves off as history. The famous example of this, have you ever seen D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation? Oh, it sounds familiar. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's, I, I, even if you haven't watched it, it's, yeah. uh, it's an early Hollywood movie, so that's why I'm bringing it up. It came out like 19... Yes, I haven't seen it, but I've definitely... Yes, okay. And this is... This is... Wasn't this really racist? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, one of, it's easily one of the most racist things I've seen in a while. Like, and like, even for the time, I think it was criticized by people. Yeah, oh, like, no. It, <laughs> it, it, like, it, it, it wrecked the film industry or something. Like, it changed the way the film industry yes. ran and made it this, like... In, in ter- yes, but in terms also of like um, production, that's why people kind of remember it and laud it is because similar to how Citizen Kane would change the way that movies are made, this one also did, but it also, contrary to Citizen Kane, also happened to be extremely racist at the same time. It's evolving, <laughs> but backwards. Right. <laughs> Citizen Kane was a good film. Right, exactly. And like, aside from the production techniques of Birth of a Nation, there's nothing good about it because it's just a glorification of the KKK. Um, that is the nation being born. Right. <laughs> exactly. But that's the thing is like, 
this movie claimed to be based in history, right? Even though there was nothing related to history about it. It's like, it's a complete rewriting of the Civil it's War. history. But what that's history? the thing. And that's what's interesting is that it was taken as a grade of truth, nonetheless, because even President Wilson at the time considered it one of his favorite movies, and he would show it regularly at the White House. And it was also like, it did really well. If I it did really right. well, right? Absolutely. And like, to bring it back to the Englishman's boy, like, I think this is the mentality that Chance is going in with. He's like, he's not interested in what the actual history is. It's in the National Film Registry, too. Yes. Which, if you look at it with a grain of salt, I can kind of see why, but it's like... Oh, 100%. It like, like a, it, it made, it's it's re- a watershed moment in cinema. Yeah, it was the rebirth of the KKK. Yeah. Like, this movie literally caused a lot of the problems of racism that currently exist in the country. 100%. But that's the thing, right? And it's like, <laughs> the, chan- the, the chance perspective is like, hey, what matters is not the history, but what matters is the feeling that it elicits and what people think mm. history should be or what history is actually about. Because to him, history is about creating a myth of national unity. Right. Right. A myth of a nation, if you will. Um, and as you're saying... Born. Exactly. And... You know, because he's going at it from a perspective that, like, America's not this once... The, the, funny enough, he's trying to make this... He's to give this impression that America can be great once more because Chance is one of those Sorry, idiots. He's trying, to, is, is he, he, he's trying to make it great again? Yeah. Well, that's... Like, he says that... Exp- I don't think he uses those terms, but he kind of says that explicitly in the novel of saying, like, my goal is to create this story that everyone in America can kind of get behind once again. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But beyond that, if we want to bring it back to like the Canadian aspect of this, right. Think of the way in which the RCMP, for example, have kind of become the symbol of Canada. Yeah. Right. Like how, like when you imagine the RCMP, do you imagine them as policemen who are trying to like eliminate (laughs) indigenous populations (laughs) from their, like, no, obviously not. You imagine like this guy in a red suit who's in front of a picture of the queen and on a nice majestic steed, right? And who's part of a million cartoons about Canada, right? But like, this was, I think, a deliberate thing because right around the 20s, and I remember reading this in a book called The Imaginary Indian, like in the 20s and 30s, Sub, the Canadian subjects did explicitly use the mounted police, right? And would glorify them in a similar way as Chance is talking about. Mm-hmm. Right? And so you see this kind of altering of history, right, through film. And that's kind of what it's become for most people because the actual event of the massacre is all but forgotten, I think, today. Right. Like, I, I don't think if you ask most people, they would know what the Cypress Hills massacre is. At best, they would recognize Cypress Hills as the rap group from the 90s. <laughs> right. Like, wait, 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 wait. So like the I I think that's kind of what they're going for in this case. And so I, I think that's the difference between textbook history and mm-hmm. Hollywood history in this case. Yes, they both have their issues, but there's a difference between rewriting history and giving a different perspective on it. I, mean, I don't know if you had anything to add on that diatribe, but um <laughs> No, I, I, I get what you, yeah, I know I agree with what you're saying. Like it's film as a medium and what we put into a film, especially our historical films, mm-hmm. is always going to be a bit of contention. Right. And there's always going to be a bit of a juxtaposition or conflict that arises from that. Right. And I think that's actually a really smart thing for Vander Hagen to do with this novel. Okay. Because otherwise it's just a novel about the event. Yeah. Like there's exactly. nothing else really to it. But this 1920s twist provides some real commentary about what's going on. And because if you watch the movie, Bob Hoskins' character goes into this long monologue about Mm -hmm. how this film will change cinema and how it emblematizes. Emblematizes? Emblematizes? I don't know. It's It's emblematic of. Yeah, it's emblematic of an American (laughs) time period. It's emblematic of the American dream and perseverance and all these other things, you know? In this 1920s golden age of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it so dangerous almost. Right. You know, because it's, you see how a story like this, which is act, this is a story of the mistreatment of First Nations people and the massacre and death of however many, 13, 14, 20. First Nation, 20 First Nations people. That, that's that, subject to debate, by the way, because there were no, like the statistics are kind of fuzzy, right. but some people say more. But. It's, 
it's this is the story of a group of First Nations people being treated horribly for doing nothing. Yes. Like literally shot and killed for doing nothing, and the people who committed the crime get no punishment. Yes, exactly. And the people who committed the crime then get turned into American heroes for pursuing their fucking horse, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's more the power, that's the real power of this film and this miniseries and this book is its mm-hmm. commentary on how we change who we change narratives yeah we change narratives we change stories to suit our liking and how we use these stories to then give reasons and give a a a qualitative reason yes it's power really at this point like and i think this is particularly true when you're looking at chance's character the bob hoskins um character it's like bob hoskins he has like you see this explicitly at some point where he talks about the power, for example, that he has over Harry, because Harry throughout the is like the most sympathetic character out of all these ostensibly really shitty characters. Yeah, like yeah, horrible. Harry, Harry just wants to write a story. That's like, literally all he wants. <laughs> like he's, he's a bro, <laughs> like and like, but he still kind of sucks in a way because he has no backbone. Yeah. But at, at some point, I think Bob uh, Damon Chance. I, rem- I forget if that happens in the movie or not, but in the book, basically calls Harry out for what kind of power he has over him, mm-hmm. right? By saying, look, I'm the one with the money here. I'm the one who's hiring you to write this story. If you don't want to do it, I can tell, I can say whatever I want about you. And here's where it shows that it's like in the 1920s, because it's like, I could tell people that your girlfriend is Jewish. I could tell people that you're a communist, even if you're not, Right. I could ruin you. Dirty communist. <laughs> right? It's like, I was at the time of like the first Red Scare, so whatever. But like the point is, I, I think, and this is a really kind of interesting moment in the book, is saying like, whatever narrative I decide to say. That's the narrative. That's the narrative. This is true because I'm the rich and powerful Hollywood type, right? And people Especially are, at this time. Especially. Hollywood executives had all the power because the studios owned the movie theaters. Yes. There, and, were, there was not there was not separated yet and by the way like a hundred years later you almost it's only now starting to crumble because you see this with like me too for example and you saw how long it took for people to like break from the narratives of what these hollywood executive types were peddling right yeah. like this is a perhaps like not at all the same type of of idea but like the the general gist of what i'm talking about i think still applies but it's like the power of narr- uh, like power is basically a matter of context in this um, in this story, and I think that's one of its main strengths. Mm-hmm. I'm actually kind of curious, just kind of shifting the the, the focus a bit here. So we're we're talking. We've been talking about the western and stuff like that. Um, the ease and the haws. Mm-hmm. And that's typically something that we associate with the American West, for example. Um, you know, the Deadwood type of story. Yeah, yeah. and. I'm wondering, like, did this, what do you think this, do you think this story, The Englishman's Boy, is trying to change the mentality that we have of, for example, the Canadian West, right? Because I've seen a few critics argue this, of saying, like, yeah, the Canadian West has kind of often been seen in this more peaceful light, but one of the strengths that The Englishman's Boy has is, like, it kind of changes that, in a sense, and says, no. Oh, God, yes. We've talked about this multiple times, that can the Canadian government's greatest ability seems to be sweeping things and putting them under the rug. Right. Absolutely. And one of the biggest ways that it does that is, like, again, for something like The Englishman, where mm. we it says that it is not as horrible as it was. The yep. Englishman's boy is the first time it's, like, really brought into the light. Yeah. But like even him at for like by the end by the 1920s he's kind of like reticent to tell his story mm-hmm. to Harry Vincent because he realizes just how horrible it actually was right and ultimately I, I think like the whole point is that he gets to go back to Canada right uh, at the end of the story if I remember correctly like he just leaves at some point because of his shame of having told the story right yeah. um, and it's yeah it, it's kind of interesting where you get that sweeping under the rug again of like, yes, it was terrible. You get this acknowledgement, but the fact that no one's talking about it, right. Especially not the person or one of the people who was explicitly involved in it. Right. That kind of perpetuates the myth of the Canadian West, right. As this Mm -hmm. relatively peacefully settled place. It was a peaceful affair. Right. Exactly. And I do think 
the novel kind of brings this up explicitly by making it an American story, right? Damon Chance is not interested in making a story of the Canadian West, even though, like you were mentioning at the first, at the start, this is where it happens. <laughs> yes, it was Americans and Canadians that were doing it, but it happened in Canada. Mm. Right? But despite that, um, it's e- it's more easily transposable. It's more easily imaginable in the American West than it is in Canada, right? Because it fits better within the national myth that the U.S. has created about themselves, right? right? And I think you see this, by the way, in the way that people at the time spoke of the massacre, because they put a hell of a lot of emphasis on the fact that they were Americans that perpetuated it, kind of ignoring the fact that there were like five or six Canadians in the group as well. (laughs) I I don't know. I I forget how many people were in total. No, but I get what you're you're saying. (laughs) But like, it was very convenient for Canada's national myth to point to the fact there were Americans (laughs) That were doing this was the americans mm-hmm. and they were coming and even if there were some canadians they were coming from the states so they were not real canadians <laughs> they were coming to take our jobs sure <laughs> or coming to take our land right they took the jobs right so it's like again uh the idea of what the what are the americans up to are they trying to steal our land and that kind of justifies the further construction of the railway and further policing. Like it's a weird, vicious cycle of justifying themselves, right? That ultimately happens. Um, What do you, I I, I guess as a cap off, because we've already been speaking for like an hour at this point, as a kind of um, way to to, to cap this off, like why do you think it's, uh, why do you think that Vanderhaeg as an author, right? Would have chosen this particular story, right? The Cypress Hills Massacre as the backdrop for his narrative. Like like we were saying, the Cypress Hills Massacre is kind of unknown in the grand scheme of Canadian history for the, for the most part. Like, why do you think it was important to use this as a backdrop for a really well-received and popular book? Um, so why the Cypress Hills Massacre? Mm-hmm. Do you think it it's, has like any importance to... Yeah, I think it does. I think it's so far that it's a real event that led to major consequences. Mm, yeah. The, North, the Mounted Police would always be there. Like, it was always a thing. But this yeah, it, really sped up the process. Exactly. And in speeding up the process, you you forget to do a lot of checks and balances. Mm. A lot of times, that's what's forgotten in a sped up process, is you don't take the time to check what's going on and, and to, give it pro- to properly shake it. Right. So I think picking this event, this small, almost innocuous event, Right, like we, it's 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 a massacre. It is like I'm not going to diminish the death of these people, but it's not as it's not what people traditionally think of in a massacre. No, there have certainly been worse ones in Canadian history. Exactly, bigger, mm-hmm. louder, but this sort of like small event that then led to this much bigger consequence. Right, I think that's what makes it so important to set this as the backdrop. And again, as you were saying, this idea that it's an American thing, or mm. because Americans caused it, it just happened on Canadian soil. You know? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I also find it interesting that that like the time period that he's talking about here. Right, there's mm-hmm. fifty years between the two narratives. Fifty years is not huge in the grand scheme of things, right? But I think it's he chose this narrative just to show the fickleness of history in a sense, right? 50 years is nothing, but the story has time to change and be altered and be forgotten and reappear in the media in a different form, like a huge number of times in 50 years, right? Like think about, think about what happened 50 years ago here. So like 1972, right? What happened in 1972 that you can like with with certainty say happened? It's like almost nothing (laughs) off the top of your head. So like there is this kind of malleability to history that I think there he's pointing to, and especially with the advent of film that solidifies that much more than ever had been done before in history. Right? Um, There was a really interesting critic that I was reading in preparation for this um, for this episode where he alludes to another thinker called Walter Benjamin, um, who has this concept of the aura, right? Um, he And Benjamin specifically uses it in terms of works of art, right? That something has an aura that can't be replicated or reproduced, right? Um, but he, the, the original critic that I'm talking about, uses it to talk about the aura of history, right? And how there's 
one of the things that Damon Chance in this case is trying to do is replicate this aura, right? Like this flash moment in history, he's trying to grab the essence of it and recreate it for his own purposes. And I think that's, I think the power of this small moment is that because it's so unknown, it has the ability to be repossessed, mm -hmm. right? In a sense. Um, any final thoughts about this work, this subject? <laughs> How do you think it'll inform you going forward, I think, if at um, all? It's not about changing what goes forward. It's more about, for me, how we understand the past. Mm -hmm. So, like, because I already knew that the police were, that the police needs a restructuring and a re-look at what it does and what it's about and what yep. it's supposed to be. Sure. But this is a, this reinforms that in so far that I'm like, this, it's nice to know why this came to be and how this, because now the Mounties are... They are under a lot of scrutiny, to say yes. the least. And they have been for quite some time, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like, once we'll get to the, uh, like, FLQ and October crisis, like, we we'll should see some of the things that were... <laughs> but anyway. But now you, you can see why and it, things are starting to... Things are starting to coalesce, I guess you could say. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, damn it. Uh, y I think you're absolutely right. Like, have you seen... Have you seen even recently, it's it's not specifically related to the RCMP, but when you're talking about like changes in police structure, yeah. the Toronto Police Service getting like put on full blast uh, in this last week. Oh my God, what happened? Because like classic things that they're uh, of course. Sp specifically targeting uh, minority populations. And in this case, they were talking a lot about African Canadian populations or black Canadians. When don't um, they? Yeah, exactly. And the police chief... I think it was the police chief where he offered an apology and formalized apology, but in a conference, that, in that conference in which he offered an apology, one of the people who's a black woman, an activist, um, stood up and said, yo, I don't care about your apology. What I want is a change in the system. I want you to stop killing us, like mm -hmm. change the structure of what you're doing, right? And it, I think that moment is just a slap in the face, first of all, but also points to this history that we're kind of talking about in which it goes so much deeper than just modern policing, right? Like the very structure of and reason why policing exists kind of points to why this is still happening today. Yeah. Right. That's kind of what I mean by like taking things from it. And I don't think either of us are kind of arguing that there should be no police ever. Right. No, there is I'm not I'm not uh, God, it's I'm not for the full defunding and removal of the police. Like I just want to make that clear, but, but it does need to change. Oh god, yes. <laughs> like Jesus. There needs to be a total re-examination and again, like taking a look at the structure of it all and mm -hmm. what's the point of the police? Mm -hmm. What are they there for? Because yep. they're not actually there to like protect the people. No. They have first and foremost always been there to protect the things and the stuff. Yes. And so you have to, I think it's tough have to take a look at it division by division, you know, because what a detective does is very different from what a uniform officer does. Those mm -hmm. are two very different roles and they serve very different purposes. Right. And detectives, they, you don't hear as many detectives doing the really shitty, awful things because no. they're not a first responder. That's true. Like yep. your average uniform officer that is a first responder, that's, and that's where we see a lot of the problems arise because they're the first on the scene. You have these reactions like, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. Training doesn't seem to be helping either. So what else can we do? Exactly. Yep. So we're not going to be answering this question anytime soon. But, no, God, no. Um, <laughs> like I do, go, I, I do think going forward, the people who are interested should actually listen to the communities that are actually trying to like bring about police re reform because Mac and I, like we've mentioned many times before, we're not the ones who are most affected by this. Um, like as two white dudes, we're not the ones that are most affected by police like, antagonism in any way. But I think God, no. it should be, I, I think I'll, I'll use our platform at least to tell people to actually listen to these groups who are affected by it and say like, listen to what they're trying to say and like why they're trying to say it. And I think the episode that we did just now points directly to this, right? Um, there's plenty of community organization that's happening in all kinds of cities across Canada. You will have plenty of opportunities to see um, different solutions to what is ostensibly a, like an international problem um, at this point. Anyway, 
Mac, yeah. next week, yes. I think we're doing Pop Canada. Yes. Nice. So if you want to have access to that next episode of Pop Canada, what can you do? And all the answer, all the episodes that came previously. Of course. Naturally, which we have like 20-something episodes now. No, of like Canada. 15. Okay. I forget. We have a lot. The point is. We have a lot now. <laughs> but, what can people do? So you can go onto Patreon, support mm -hmm. us through Patreon. Mm -hmm. It's about $2, I believe. $3. $3. And then you get access to all our full-length episodes. You have early access to them. You get the shout-outs, as we said before. Hell yeah. We provide Patreon access. You get episodes of Top Canada. Yep. And early episodes of this show. And early episodes of this show. We have unedited versions episodes of this show as well. If that's what you're interested in, you get to hear all the little screw-ups and fuck-ups that they make that Patrick edits <laughs> out. And if you don't want to support us, that's also fine. The show will remain free as always because we just like CBC believe in giving the people free access to information and education services. There you go. Other ways you can help out the show include leaving a review on iTunes is a big one. Spotify as well. <laughs> Spotify, telling your friends about us, spreading the word out a bit. Uh, and yeah. Absolutely. Tell us this and let us know what you think of the show. We're Generally, happy to hear when we're wrong. So far, like we've had really good reviews. Like our average, pretty much on all platforms, is about four point five five. Ayo. Yep. Out of twenty, by the way. Oh. Out of twenty, by the way. <laughs> is it actually out of twenty? No. Okay. Out of five. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's what the people think of us. That's what the people think of us, and that's okay. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So with that being said, thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you in two weeks time for a regular episode of Historia Canadiana, which I forget what it's going to be about. And if not, we'll see you next week for an episode of Pop Canada. Ooh, Here we yes. have the next one to be 19th century utopias. Yeah, that's cool. It's like, this is a really interesting book, actually. I encourage you to read it back. Okay. It's I'll see. for sure you'll be able to find it online. Anyway, thanks everyone for listening. Cheers all. Cheers.